If you have your Bibles this morning, and that should be a must, turn to the book of Matthew 25. thought we'd take a, a little bit of a uh, reprieve um, uh, out of Ephesians this morning and go backwards and look at um, some kingdom doctrine here in the book of Matthew. And so I wanted to deal with one of the parables in the parable of the talents in the book of Matthew in chapter 25. Now, why would I do such a thing? Because it's in the Bible. Yeah. And I want to. Uh, I think it's good sometimes to um, get into the grace doctrine, Romans through Philemon. And you stay there for a while, and then you come back and you look at these books, and you begin to see the differences in and it's kind of like, wow, that, that, that does say a little something different, doesn't it? There, there is a different doctrine there, isn't there? And it begins to, I think, I think it begins to set in. Um, as we've talked about many times, uh, most of churchianity is just stuck in a thing of thinking that everything is the same from Matthew all the way out to Revelation. There's just one gospel, there's just one doctrine, there's just one thing going on. And that's not so. Uh, if we've taught anything here, we've taught that the great two divisions in your Bible are prophecy and mystery, and it's important to see the two. And here, what we're dealing with this morning in Matthew chapter 25, we're going to use the chart quite a bit because uh, there's obvious reasons for that when you're in Matthew to understand that you're on the prophetic timeline back here. And what this timeline is doing is it's looking out to this time here of tribulation, and it's looking out over here to Christ coming back in His earthly kingdom. Many people do not see the distinction between the kingdom of heaven and we going up to heaven. That's two different spheres, okay? And many people don't see that. So here we're going to look at, and let me preface the, the teaching this morning, the subject is the kingdom of heaven. That's not a spiritualized kingdom that we're bringing in today. The kingdom of heaven is a physical, literal kingdom in which God's going to set up in the earth. It's going to come down. He's going to set it up in the earth. So the subject is the kingdom of heaven. The theme to these people in which he's talking to is to be ready. Now that's them. Be ready. He's going to give them the word to be ready. You're ready this morning, whether you're asleep or whether you're awake, if you've believed the gospel of your salvation, you're ready for your taking away. If you've been saved, you're going up when Christ comes. Whether that's shame-faced or not, you're going up. Okay? Whether you chose to play golf today or not, you're going up if you're saved. Right from the golf course, right? You're in the body of Christ, playing golf didn't take you out of the body of Christ. But these people here, they have given warnings and they're given word to not just be a hearer, but to be a doer and to prepare themselves and to be ready for they know not the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Okay? And so when people read this a lot of times, they take the body of Christ and they put us in these passages. You are not in Matthew 25, folks. You're not in any of the Gospels. Okay, Jesus is talking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's leading them, and He is guiding them. You've heard me say it before. If you're going to get your doctrine out of them books, the next thing you got on your calendar should be the 70th week of Daniel. If you're a prophetic person in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's your next endeavor is the tribulation. I've got good news for you. You're not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and your next endeavor is not the tribulation. It's the rapture. Well, I don't like the word rapture because it's not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. But I believe it's the Word of God. Okay? You ever thought about that? So, preface this by saying that this is not talking about us. It's not talking about the tribulate or the um, saints that will not go through the tribulation, which are the body of Christ. It's going to talk about Israel, who is going to go through the tribulation. Seventy weeks have been determined on God's people Israel. Sixty-nine right here at the cross when he was cut off for the sins of his people, one more week of years remain, and that's the 70th week. And this is what these books are telling these people about. All right? So let's read, we'll pray, and we'll go into the teaching. 
Um, just in case you want to know how I know this subject is about the kingdom of heaven, verse 14, 25 and 14. For the kingdom of heaven <laughs> is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five talents. That does not mean he could play the guitar, he could play the fiddle, he could play the piano, he could play another five instruments. That's not what it means, folks. The talents here is a measure and a value of money. Okay, the talents. It's not about him giving you a talent to go on American Idol. To another two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two he also gained two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. He hid the talent. Right? So talent and money. You see that? Alright. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought forth five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Enter into the kingdom. All right. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I had not straw. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine with usury, with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him that have ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that have not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Cast him ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for another opportunity to come and study your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to gain clarity from the scripture, that the body of Christ be edified this morning. We pray for the lost. We pray for the sick. And we just pray for the next few minutes that you would be with us in spirit of your word to help enlighten us in your word and we'll give you all the praise honor and glory and everyone did say amen so this kingdom of heaven that we're talking about when we're talking about a doctrinal uh, kingdom that's been prophesied since the world began and he uses this parable to show that he had brought these three servants together two of which were profitable and one obviously was unprofitable. Can I tell you that when we go stand before the Bema Seat of Christ, there's going to be people there who are unprofitable. But they're not cast out into outer dark darkness. Even though their work may be burned up completely, they shall be saved even so as by fire. You can find that in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. Okay? So we're not saved by what we do. We're not saved by what we don't do. We're saved by the grace of God. We're saved that we ought to do good works. Okay? 
But there's people in the body of Christ who are not working. Okay? And their salvation and their going to heaven is not based on that. Here we find a warning that Jesus Christ is not just telling these through this parable that they should be ready, but also they should be faithful. That they should be faithful to do that which He had commanded them to do, had shown them to do by His Word. Be faithful and ready. Look back at Matthew 24 and 44. And watch the warning here. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. That's a warning to them. Look up at uh, 42, that same chapter. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. They're going to have signs knowing that His coming is near. But they won't know the exact day and they won't know the exact hour. So what should they be doing? They should be faithful. They should be doing, okay, to the word that was given unto them. Here's the confusion. When we give their word, their, word, their doctrine to the body of Christ, we are now out of the will of God, trying to do something that wasn't given to us. And when you take the word given unto us and put it back over to them, it doesn't work. There's two different plans in the Bible. That which was spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, that which was kept secret. Here is part of what's been spoken since the world began. He is revealing things to them about this earthly kingdom that had been spoken about that he even kept as a mystery for the kingdom age, but he's now he's revealing it to them. Now, let me say this. The parables, a lot of people say, well, they're to make things understood. Actually, they weren't. They were to make things complex for those who were not believers. They were made to hide things from those who had not trusted. And then Christ would give the parable in an audience. And then He would pull to the side and explain that parable to His disciples that they could have understanding. All right. So look at the uh, verse 14 here. And see that he delivered unto his servants goods. All right, look at verse 15. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Now watch how he gives them to every man according to his several ability. I take the word ability there to mean, one, I take the goods, is that he gave the word of God. He, say, he, he, he sowed the word of the kingdom into them so that they would know what was coming down the road so they would understand this time of tribulation the suffering and then the glory that should follow that suffering he's reminding them that it's going to be hard what they ought to do is go out and invest in the kingdom there's people today thinking they're doing that people today think that our job is to get the world good enough to where Christ will come back have you noticed it's only getting worse right did Paul say that it was going to get better? No, he said it was going to get worse. Right? So we're not trying to make the world a better place to go to hell from. What we're trying to do is tell people about the gospel grace that will save them from hell. What Jesus Christ is doing here is warning this remnant group to be ready to not turn back, to not give up, but to be ready at His coming. And He gave them the word of the kingdom that they could be ready by. Right? Why do I believe it's the word of the kingdom and understanding the word of the kingdom is the goods that he gave unto them? Because I have more scripture to look at. Look over at uh, Matthew 13. I believe their ability was their ability to understand and by understanding their faith was increased. Notice that all three in the passage were servants. Notice all three were giving something, right? But it was given to their ability. So the one with five talents, in my mind, he had more understanding. He had more faith because of understanding. Anybody in here, since you've came to the understanding of where you're at in the Word of God, you have more faith? 
you have more faith based on what you know about grace and who you are in the Word of God than you did, hopefully, when you started with this. And so their understanding, and more understanding they have, I believe their faith grows from that, and that's going to help them to get through that trying time that is to try their faith. So look here in Matthew and chapter 13, and look at verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. I can believe maybe that servant number three, the unprofitable servant, was the one who got the seed by the wayside. He just didn't last. He didn't do what God had said to do. He didn't have the faith to go out and invest and do what the Lord wanted him to do with his talent, that one talent that he had. So what did he do? He hid it, okay, that it might be there when the Lord returned. But the Lord said, no, go do. Go do, right? What's here in uh, Matthew 3, uh, 13, the same chapter, and look at verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that, what, heareth the word, and he understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. Did the first two servants bear fruit? First servant had five, he came back with ten. The second fruit increased, or second servant increased his fruit by investing, did he not? But the one who didn't understand, the one who didn't follow up, the one he didn't do by faith, the one who was not doing what he ought to be doing, he did not increase his, he hid it, right? Which also bear fruit and bringeth forth fruit, watch, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So there was increase in the first two servants. There was doing in the first two servants. The first two servants had faith. They had understanding to what they were to do, and they acted on their faith. The second, or the third, had lack of faith to go do what he should have done. You remember who said, faith without works is dead? James. That doctrine lines up with this doctrine, right? Look over at James real quick. Look at 1.22. Let me ask you this. In the dispensation of grace, is faith without works dead? Faith without my works is not dead. It took work, but it's Christ's work. So my faith in Christ is alive. Not because of my faith, but because of His faith. The faith of Christ. You see what I'm saying? So a man can have faith in the work of Christ, be saved, and not have works of his own. Now, the religious mind, the covenant mind, run all over the Bible and get you all these scriptures about doing stuff. But listen, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by what? By His mercy He saved us, right? So you understand. So look here at uh, 1 and 22. Of James. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only. In the parable, there were two that heard and they were doers. Right? There's one who heard and he wasn't a doer. And watch, deceiving your own selves. Did servant number three deceive himself? He did. He deceived himself by believing that he could hold back a talent, he could hide that talent, and when the Lord come, he'd be pleased that he held on to that one talent. But the Lord wasn't pleased, was he? He said, I should have done something. You should have invested my money that when I come, I might have received it with usury. I might have received it with interest. It might have been multiplied. Right? Look at verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a natural man, he is like a, a to a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he behold himself and go up his way and straightway forgetteth the manner of man he was. See that? So whoever, whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, was the third guy a forgetful hearer? Yeah, he was. But a doer of the work, 
This man shall be blessed in his deed. The first two servants were blessed in their deed because they were invited to go into the joy of the Lord, which is the kingdom. The third man was what? Cast out into outer darkness. Do you see that? Can you see the parallels that James is back on kingdom ground when James is writing? How do I know James is not speaking to me, somebody? He's not writing to me. Huh? Chapter 1, verse 1 of James. Look at it. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. In the body of Christ, there's no twelve tribes. And you don't belong to one. Okay? We're all one in Christ. So James now is back on kingdom ground to a covenant Israel speaking and writing to the twelve tribes of Israel. And that goes right along with Galatians chapter 2. The agreement that was made. Understand? So we can see that James now is picking back up in this doctrine that was over in the four Gospels and early Acts. Okay? So with that being said, I want you to look at um, Matthew 24, 47. Hopefully I hadn't called that out already. 46 and 47. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. What did James say? Doers. And that covenant, do. Be faithful to the end. Do something. Hold fast to that word of the kingdom and do it. Not just hear it. Don't deceive yourselves by thinking it's just good enough to hear it, but you must be a doer of it, right? Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his what? His goods. And the parable said that he gave unto them his goods. All right, so you see that. All right, look at Matthew 25 and 21. Those that did, talking about the first and the second servant in the parable, we've already read it, but look at it again. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Okay? Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So it's important that they be found faithful. So servant with five talents was a hearer and a doer with faith and understanding. The second was the same. Notice they had two different values. One had five. One had two. One had one. Right? The two faithful multiply. The unfaithful is unprofitable. He doesn't multiply. He's kicked out. All right? Look at uh, 530 to confirm that. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? In conjunction with that, I know that it's this time over here that he's speaking of because he starts verse 31 when he's going to talk about the nations. He starts with this. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all of His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit up on what? His throne of glory. Over here. In the teachings that we have had, are we looking for Jesus to come and sit up on His throne of glory? Or are we looking for Him to come in the clouds and take the church, the body of Christ out? That's what we're looking for. That's our glorious hope, is to leave and to go be with Him, right? To call us out. Is heaven coming down to us or are we going to go up to heaven? We're going to go up to heaven, right? So understanding that these parables here are prophetic. They're for Israel's time 
of Jacob's trouble, the sufferings, and the glory that should follow. Just as Christ suffered on the cross and the glory to follow, they're going to suffer. It's been prophesied upon them. You can write it down. It's going to happen. It's going to come up on all the earth, by the way. It's going to happen. It's in God's plan. It's in God's book. It's going to happen, and they must go through that time before they can come into the joy of the Lord over here and enjoy the fullness of that new covenant and to where they have rest, they have peace from all their enemies, and they have everlasting life in that kingdom. Because when that kingdom begins, there will be no end. Okay? So for 1,000 years they reign with Christ, and then eternity there's no end of God's kingdom. Can you see that? What's the point of teaching something this way? You don't have a clue how many people think this is church talk, body of Christ talk. There is a church, but it's not the body of Christ church. See, people do certain words certain ways. Baptism. Only one thing of baptism in all the Bible, that's water. Folks, there's multiple baptisms in the Bible. People see the word saved or salvation. That means saved from your sin forever. Saved and salvation has multiple meanings in the Bible. People see the word church in the Bible. That's one thing. It's always been the church. There's multiple churches in the Bible. You've got to know which one you belong to. And where is the doctrine of that church in the Bible for you? It's not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Might I say this? If you can't find your gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't find your doctrine in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's spiritual application that can be made from these books but the doctrine is kingdom doctrine for this earthly kingdom people over here. It's not to the church, the body of Christ. That's exactly right. All right? So look at Luke chapter 12 with me. You know, it really upsets people when you say not all the Bible is written to you. Because they act like when you say that, that you mean you don't study any other Bible. I mean, what? How many times have we gone through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Psalm, Genesis? How many times have we done it? I mean, geez, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. I mean, we have taught from, I mean, most every book in the entire Bible. But did I teach you that stuff as it applies to you today, and that's your doctrine to follow? You know, the they come on and they think they've got you trapped when they say stuff like that. All the Bible's written to me, every bit of it. I said, well, then you've got to explain why you're not sacrificing animals. Okay? Why I saw you down here at the greasy pig eating bacon yesterday. Right? You know, that was forbidden back there in the Levitical law. Why you're not, you know, going to the temple at the hour of prayer. Just dummy down the system so you can say I'm doing it all. No, you're not doing it all. You know you're not doing it all, right? So listen, folks, just to jump into the Bible carelessly and just say, boy, there I am, that looks good. Well, you're okay when it's looking good, but when it looks bad, what are you going to do with it? People don't like the Jesus that shows up in the Scriptures when you start reading these parables. See, what religion will teach you is to build your own Jesus. You know, Loving Jesus, okay? Love, bug, love, love, love. But did you not hear what he said about those folks over there in 25, that one? He said, throw him into outer darkness. That was Jesus, folks. Red letters. See, we know Jesus loves, but we also know that Jesus is coming back in flaming fire and judgment to make war. You get it? You get it? People just love, man, they just want to find the love of Jesus. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, folks, there's something that goes along with the love of Jesus. You either do as he commanded to do, or you cast into outer darkness. He wouldn't do that. Why did he write it? Huh? Look here in 1242. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? See, these three servants were to be stewards over their goods, over God's goods. And that's what a steward is. Whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall what? Find so doing. 
read the rest of this because it's good. You get to see loving Jesus right here in these next verses. Watch this. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if, that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and I shall begin to beat the manservant, and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and shall will cut him asunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. See that? Sweet Jesus. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself. What did I say that the theme was in 25? To know, understand, and be ready. Prepare yourself. What does it say here? He fails to prepare himself. Neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. I believe that's a manner of the different le levels of judgment. Many stripes and few stripes. Those who know more are required in the kingdom doctrine to do more. Okay? To do more with what they've got. After all, what was the theme over there? They were given five, they were given two. The one that was given five was given it because he had more understanding, he had more faith, he was to do more with it, and he did. Number two, did. Number three, he didn't prepare himself. What? For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much, what? Required. And to him who, who have committed much, of him they will ask the more. And I am come, see, I am come to send grace on the earth. No, I'm come to send fire on the earth, folks. Listen, real quick. You ought to jump up and down like Snoopy because you have that yellow spot on that map right there where God is dispensing grace. He's giving grace to whoever. It don't matter what their name is, how big a sinner they are, what they're doing in this life. He's dispensing grace to them. They can be saved by God's marvelous grace. Folks, Right here he said he's coming to send fire and judgment up on the earth. He is going to make war with the nations and those who are out to destroy Israel and those who oppose him, he is going to bring judgment on them. And the people who are in this doctrinal timeline of the kingdom who turn away and they fall back, they are going to suffer the wrath of God. All those who oppose God are going to suffer the wrath of God. Sweet Jesus is coming back. Now, the picture of sweet Jesus, the way we have him painted, the way religion paints him, is not quite like the Bible paints him. See, this tender, mild little baby that lays in a cradle, folks, he grew up. He's the man Christ Jesus, right? Oh, he's poured out his love and his grace upon us in abundance, and what are we doing with it? Trampling it under our feet. The world is spitting in the face of God and his Son. But he's going to send them a strong delusion. He takes this church out, this body of Christ, all the people in the world who think they're having their way and they're having a good time and they're living and doing whatever it is they want to do. Good is evil and evil is good. I tell you, God's got a plan for those too. Sweet Jesus. Revelation 19. This ain't on the notes, but I'll give it to you. I won't even charge you. Folks, this ain't sweet baby Jesus here. Look at 19 and 11 of Revelation. I really don't like those people who talk about Jesus like this. My preacher tells me about the love and how we are all to love. We are to love. We should love. But you've got to understand the same Jesus is pouring out grace today is going to pour out judgment war in the ages to come, folks. You need to understand that. You don't want to be here without Him. You want to go up. Watch this, 1911. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteous. He does judge and make war. His eyes were blue, no, his eyes were as flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And as he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, 
and His name is called the Word of God. Hold Jesus. The Word of God. Watch. And the armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses and clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of His mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it He should smite the nations. He don't have to come down and pick up any tool. He just speaks the Word. He is the Word. His mouth opens with a sword that smites the nation. And He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Sweet Jesus is not looking as sweet there, is it, folks? You better get a hold of sweet Jesus today while He's pouring out His grace upon you, while He's made it available for you to be saved without any works of yours and not get into doing and not get into religion and not getting into thinking that you're Israel and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but jump over to where Paul wrote how you heathenistic, no good for nothing, non-covenant people could come to Christ and be made nigh by the blood. That's where you better get yourself. Oh, I'm doing the law. My back leg, you're doing the law. You ain't doing no law. What you're doing is what you call the law that you've dummied down to make the law. You need the grace of God what you need. Watch here, sweet Jesus. And he have on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Sweet Jesus. Cast them into outer darkness, a wailing and a gnashing of teeth. Man, when I was in covenant theology, that used to bother me. Now that I know I'm saved by the grace of God, by faith in what Christ did, and He can't deny Himself, I'm as good as being there this morning. Man alive, I can rest in my salvation. Their rest is future, folks. Do you think there's rest in that wrath? Huh? Oh, the Word of God's going to come from to a degree. Look here at First, uh, first Peter. Without the Holy Ghost, without the Word of God, you think about that time. What First Peter says in verse uh, chapter four, verse twelve. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you, folks. That ain't today because you're behind on the rent or the car payment. Oh, I'm going through a fiery trial. The fiery trial is over here in the time of wrath for Israel. Oh, I had a bad day. Somebody shot my dog. Or it, it, It's silly what we do with the Word of God, man, when you don't understand the Word of God. He's talking about a fiery trial that is to try Israel's faith. Is mine and your tri uh, faith on trial today? No, my faith was tried at the cross when he went to the cross put himself on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again. My faith has already been tried. All I got to do now is put faith in what he did. That's the faith of Christ. They're going to go through a trial. It was promised to them. You say, well, why is it different uh, for them than it is us? Because they're God's covenant people. And they fell under the old system. And God had promised them that cursing because they cursed, right? And he promised them that time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period, I know people don't want to believe the Bible that way, but that's what happens, folks. This time is going to try the earth. It's going to try Israel. It's going to separate the wheat from the tares. That unbelieving group that say they are of Israel, true believing, are going to fall away. They're going to take the mark of the beast. And I believe that's exactly what happened with the five virgins over there in Matthew 25. I believe they fell away. I believe they took the mark. I believe that's Hebrews 6. I believe they take the mark. They're going to fall away. True Israel is going to stay with faith and come through the fire. Amen? But there's going to be much tribulation. Look at verse 13. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. What would that be like to be in that type of tribulation and still rejoice? That when His glory shall be revealed. See that? You may be glad also with exceeding joy. You can go back to Zechariah 13.9 and see some of that. Alright? So what I want to say to you this morning... Don't confuse Israel's doctrine in this Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with us today. When you blend those things together, what happens? It makes them hard to distinguish. We're going to finish on this. Luke 19, 
And just in comparison, Luke 19. If y'all think I'm yelling, it's because this thing behind me is running. I don't have a microphone that gets to you. I just have one that records. So I get a little excited sometimes. I, hey, I'm way, I'm way less excitable than Brother Brian. Brother, I, I love the way he does it. I know a couple of them like that, but that's good too. Watch verses 12 here through 27 and see the parallel of chapter 25 of Matthew. He said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country, Jesus Christ left, went to heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called ten servants and delivered the, them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But the citizens hated him, that's unbelieving Israel, hated him, and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man reign over us. You can also go back to Luke 13 and see that. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound have gained ten pounds. He was fruitful. And he said unto him, Well, uh, well thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful and very little, have thou authority over ten cities. There they are reigning in the kingdom. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound have gained five pounds. He was fruitful. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. Another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin, unfruitful. For I fear thee, because thou art an asture man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an astute man taken up that I laid down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thy money into the bank, invested it, that I might, at my coming I might have required mine own with usury interest, and he said unto them that stood by, watch this, take from him that pound and give it to him that had ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he had ten pounds. For I say unto that, every one which has shall be given, and from him that haveth not, even that he shall be taken away from him. Watch sweet Jesus in this verse. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Uh, that, that Jesus gets made up very few times in religion. We like the mild and tender. God is a God of grace and mercy. And He's a God of wrath and judgment. We get lopsided sometimes and only see Him one way. Now, I don't want to focus on Him today as in judgment and war because that's not what He's doing today. He's dispensing grace today. Right? You see that these doctrines are not written to the body of Christ? Have you ever heard Paul in Romans through Philemon preaching that type of doctrine to the body of Christ? No, you didn't hear it. Why? Because he received new revelation. He received progressive revelation. He received new doctrine. He received the mystery, which had been kept secret. Hopefully you can see that. All right? Hopefully that helps you. If nothing else, it just gave you a little bit of a break from what we've been doing, but if not, that's okay. If you like it, write a check. If you don't, write a check. So that way you'll feel good, you'll feel balanced. Okay? If you can pay for good teaching, you can pay for bad teaching. It's all the same. Money's all going to the same place, right? And that I might come and find it with usury. Okay. I am uh, joking when it comes to money. We don't even take up an offering around here, do we? We let you give as God has purposed in your heart. Sometimes I'm wondering about the size of those hearts, but I, I'm picking. I'm totally picking. I'm joking, love. Y'all stand to your feet this morning before I dig a hole I can't get out of, and that won't take long as short as I am. All right. Thank y'all so much for being here today. 
It looks like we've got a good crowd this morning. It looks like we've got about eight more than Noah had. That's good. That's, I'm, 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 prou- I'm proud of that. That's good stuff. Glad to have Brother Willie and Elizabeth with us this morning. And as all the regulars, good to have you here this morning. All right, let us pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the word of truth. We thank you, Lord, that we do see distinctions in the word of God. That we are to rightly divide truth from truth. That we are to see who we are in Christ. That we can learn much and apply much that is given out of the four Gospels. But Lord, the heart of our doctrine for our obedience and our faith and what we should be doing today, you gave that to our apostle, the Apostle Paul. And along with that, Lord, you gave him the gospel of the grace of God. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Any soul that would hear that message and believe it and trust it by faith can be saved today. Anyone in this room, they don't have to move a muscle. They don't have to run down and get to an altar. They don't have to cry tears. They don't have to beg for forgiveness. They can simply believe what you said, what you promised, that if we would believe it, that we would trust it without our own works, that you would justify us freely. We believe that. We've received that. And we pray that everyone that hears that message will do likewise. In the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, we give you praise, honor, and glory. And everyone did say, Amen. Amen.